thank you also very much for being here in the very end of the day. You are really brave, definitely as brave as we are here on the stage. Um, I, I would have actually loved to have you a little bit closer, but uh, it's okay if you want to sit there. But it's also okay if you want to move closer uh, to get a little bit more engaged. But I will definitely give you a chance to respond, uh, those who like, of course. And as said, um, I think uh, it's the today at least the most uh, mouth-watering discussion here in Paide. And uh, as said, uh, today all diets are welcome. So uh, whether you are a meat lover, you are a vegan, paleo, keto, whatever you have, uh, you're free to express uh, your uh, preferences and, and, and views. Uh, maybe there are some new people that uh, have not been attending the previous uh, shows here. As you can see, we have a sign language interpretation here. Uh, the event is also uh, live streamed. And uh, it's okay to also uh, intervene in Estonian. Uh, we make sure that it gets to our foreign uh, guests as well. Um, I'm Madi Stilga, uh, work in the Ministry of Climate, uh, uh, formerly worked in the Nordic Council of Ministers. Uh, and uh, here we have our uh, bright panel uh, today. Um, they uh, eat food, uh, as we all do in ev everyday uh, basis, but uh, they have somewhat gone deeper into food than uh, most of us do. Uh, and I will immediately give them the floor with the first questions, but maybe uh, a little bit of clarification uh, as to the title. So I, I, I break it down for you what I meant with this title, Meatballs Killing the Green Transition. Um, the, the idea behind there is that uh, this huge process uh, called green transition that we are now undergoing in the society um, has very many aspects that also relate to our personal habits and uh, it might be easily that uh, if uh, something is taken away from people that they really like then they develop negative sentiments towards the entire process. Even though the green transition might bring along uh, many benefits to the society, to this very person, but for example, if uh, um, it is said that, okay, meatballs you can have only uh, uh, once every second week, or uh, there are like passionate travelers, flyers, for example, and uh, if the restrictions become really personal or personalized, then uh, we actually jeopardize the entire process. And uh, that has a very bad effect in the end, of course. So here today, we're trying to see how it is possible to make that transition while not hurting too much the people in the society. Um, and uh, my suggestion is that we uh, uh, first uh, dive into this uh, complex topic, uh, that we look at the, uh, the health of our food system as it is operating today. Um, so that gives us uh, the, the first reason why we should talk about food in, 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 in the first place. What's, what's wrong with the food system, what we have today? Maybe for many, it's, it's nothing wrong or, or they don't see it. But for that, uh, we have uh, uh, our good panel here. And um, uh, just to start off, I have uh, uh, read from a recent uh, scientific paper. Now I go. Uh, global food production constitutes the single largest driver of environmental degradation and 
transgression of planetary boundaries. Taken together, the outcome is dire. A radical transformation of the global food system is urgently needed. And uh, here it is where I turn to our, our panelist uh, asking, uh, what is your take? How dysfunctional our food system is uh, nowadays? And then when you start, please also briefly say who you are, you come from, and what you work with. Thanks. Uh, can we start with someone who has a mic? There has a mic. <laughs> please. small think tank next to, linked to Estonian Parliament. So it's a small team and our task is to, to monitor trends and uh, create alternative future scenarios. And we do it topic-wise. We haven't really covered uh, the topic of the future of food. Anyway, what we have done is, uh, as part of our bigger green transition trends and scenarios, we have tried to calculate uh, the environmental footprint of an average Estonian, uh, and comp we could also compare it to the average uh, European. And this we did based on uh, 2019 uh, consumption data. And it turned out that the Estonian footprint is uh, 3.8 times of the planetary limits. And uh, it is even uh, larger than the carbon footprint of average European, which is uh, 2.9, if I now remember correctly. Anyway, the Estonian carbon footprint or the footprint of an average Estonian is about one third bigger than the one of average European. Um, and uh, food consumption makes up 30% of this uh, ecological footprint of this average ecological footprint. Uh, so this is quite a remarkable one, but it's not the biggest. The biggest part of the carbon footprint of average Estonian is, uh, is uh, um, electricity and heating, uh, because m mainly because uh, the oil shale input in our electricity system, uh, but also because a lot of uh, uh, usage of uh, wood, uh, firewood. Uh, so it is not, we are not, in, in terms of planetary boundaries, we are not only talking about carbon emissions, this is very important, but also, uh, also the, the microparticles in the air, which are created when you heat uh, uh, your oven with firewood. But it's not a concern in, uh, in rural areas, it's only concern I co a concern in uh, highly populated areas. So this to be said, I'm not... Um, um inviting um, masses of people to, to, uh, uh, to turn down or to give up uh, uh, heating with, uh, with firewood. But coming back to the food. <laughs> so uh, one third of the carbon footprint consists uh, of, uh, of food. And uh, of course, Estonians, uh, yeah, the meat consumption habits is one of the reasons here. And also chocolate pops up as, as one of the favorites and one of the causes of, of the of the uh, of the footprint. Of course, we cannot limi limit it, it uh, to zero. That's impossible. Now, the big question to me is that, of course, we should reduce this ecological footprint coming out of uh, food. But uh, there are two parts. Uh, how to reduce it? One is, of course, let's eat less meat or less, uh, let's uh, have more pl plant-based diets. But another is, um, uh, the socio-economic environment created by uh, taxes, benefits, different kind of politics. Uh, an easy example is that why are Polish apples in our uh, supermarkets cheaper than the one that are grown in Estonia? So there has to be a reason. It's a systematic reason. This is not something that the person uh, himself or herself can do much about. So. Uh, in addition to talking about how we could change our diets as natural persons, we can also we should also talk about how to change the system so that it would uh, that it would be cheaper to buy local apple from the supermarket than the Polish apple. So how to get there? Uh, I'm not ready to to uh, offer a re recipe. Uh, <laughs> uh, just I mean out of the blue, but. Um, 
as a question perhaps to, to feed our further conversation here. Thank you. Um, shall we continue with uh, Nestle? Uh, the food system we have today, what's wrong with it? quite under the, under the sun, heating up. <laughs> well, one part of the climate, climate uh, effects, actually. Yeah, I'm Nesta Sozar. I'm a research professor at VTT, Technical Research Center of Finland. And my focus area is smart and sustainable food production. Uh, my background is in uh, food technology and, and food science. And yes, our food system is broken. It's quite complex uh, and, and actually today uh, we are in the breaking point and uh, we must really immediately take the necessary actions. And this, as said, this is, the food system is quite complex and, and it affects many, many of the things, including the climate, the environment, the biodiversity, and especially our health. And with health, I don't mean only the, the human health, but also the, the soil health, uh, animal health, and, and, and the health of our planet. And yeah, you have uh, described the, the fruits and vegetables, local production, and, and so on and so forth. But then when it comes to our diet, Proteins are one of, the, one of the important elements in our diet. They are our body's building blocks. And when it comes to the sustainability issues, obviously the current animal farming practices is the most problematic one. So what we need to, to do is actually uh, first of all, especially in the, in the Western part, another major issue that we are over-consuming the proteins. For a healthy adult, we need actually 0 0.83 grams of protein per kilogram body weight per day. And our intake so far in the Western part is much more than this, especially in, in, in Denmark, uh, in, in Spain, the consumptions are, are really, really high. So we should diversify the proteins. Plant proteins is one of those, but there are also other protein sources, uh, such as uh, fungi uh, or, or other, other microbial sources. And there are also alternative ways of producing the, so to say, the accustomed uh, animal proteins, such as uh, egg proteins or milk proteins or, or uh, meat proteins in a totally different way. Mm. So those who have, uh, who cannot give on the meatballs can still eat the meatballs, but with yeah. less yeah. Yeah. impact. I, I would like to come back to that um, health issue a little bit. Uh, and uh, I'm not even sure if you say that food system is broken. That's a, that's a very good term. I've also heard a lot. Um, but these uh, choices that we tend to consume too much of proteins, this is definitely not the lack of the food system. It's, it's the choices that we make, maybe based on marketing, maybe based on peer pressure, um, based on, on habits, whatever. But uh, if you say that food system is broken, um, can you also bring some examples what, what, what you mean by that, uh, especially, I mean, the food system is delivering. I mean, we all got fed today, uh, those who wanted. Um, it's like, uh, can you bring any? Yeah, what I meant is that, uh, first of all, the, uh, the agricultural practices that we are taking. Now, uh, uh, I would say that uh, we, are, we are increasingly going towards consumption, increasing the yields, and while we are doing the, that, we are not really taking care of the, uh, the environmental bill that we need to pay. So I meant that with the, with the food system yeah, okay. is, is broken. Okay, yeah, thanks. Shall we continue with Petri, your insights as to 
yeah, the broken food system. <laughs> I, can, I can build up from that. Yeah. Uh, is, can you hear me? I can, but... <laughs> okay, yeah, hi, I'm Petri. Um, but yeah, I would uh, uh, maybe build up on the why the food system is broken, uh, because indeed, uh, this was give, give a little bit of introduction to yourself also. Okay. And then uh, yeah. So I'm, my name is Petri Lahta. I'm an associate professor at the uh, Tallinn University of Technology. Uh, my field is food technologies and bioengineering, so I'm more on, on the technology side. And at the same time, uh, I have also uh, founded a startup company uh, on the topic of food. So we are producing alternative uh, fats and oils to replace palm oil and other non-sustainably produced um, fats. Uh, and yeah, the, the main reason why I'm, I'm doing this is exactly that uh, uh, when I realized how huge environmental burden it is to produce food that we are consuming, and then considering that uh, this food also is not really healthy for us, uh, there's huge, like there are a lot of obese people, there are a lot of people in uh, also in other places, they are um, suffering in the scarcity of food, um, and also we are producing a lot of waste uh, while we are producing food, so there's definitely better ways um, how to produce food. And um, uh, also the last serious uh, innovation in, in food uh, topics actually took place about 50 years ago. So we can see some small uh, innovation taking place in, in food, but I would claim that the biggest bigger uh, changes in, in food innovation took place actually about 50 years ago uh, when uh, people figured out how to develop better crops uh, by using mutation. And uh, since then, uh, population has doubled. So in, in 70s, uh, global population was 4 billion. Today we are over 8 billion, but we are using basically the same technologies to produce food. And that's why we are at the tipping point. Thank you, uh, Maya. Yes, uh, hello, I'm Maya Kale from Latvia and I'm very honored to be at the Estonian uh, Opinions Festival. I am uh, at the Nordic Council of Ministers office in Latvia where I work with sustainability and digitalization, but I also recently did my PhD where I researched um, more than 10 years old language data corpus of how Latvians tweet about food. And uh, that's quite interesting uh, uh, insights of um, also somewhat reflecting um, what exactly is broken this food system. And I can only already agree to what was said, but I think we also have quite uh, complexities in the way we talk about food. So Madis mentioned that the travels, it's much more easy to talk about uh, how I avoided flying and took a train read an interesting book instead. But it's so much more harder to say, like I uh, successfully avoided eating steak today <laughs> and got some cauliflower. These kind of stories just don't work. And this is just one example, but it's uh, the way we talk about food is also so complex and difficult. You also, Madis mentioned the peer pressure. Yes, yes, we all know the peer pressure of our family members. Uh, who would like us to eat more <laughs> of certain things. And, uh, you know, it's... Um, so basically also food is so very much inbound in culture. And not to say that culture is broken, but somehow we are in a very big gap between modernity, history, and uh, our rituals, our kind of um, habits. S somehow we don't catch up with the speed the population is growing, with the technology, how we can produce uh, food, and at the end of the day, our, let's say, childhood memories. There is quite a big clash between all of that, and food is not just a food that we consume, but it's also a, a metaphor, it's a memory, because food is not just nutrition, it's smell, it's emotions, it's remembering certain moments, and that's why Twitter is full with food, that's why Instagram is full with food, everywhere you go, you will see food. Yeah, thanks for bringing this uh, sensational part uh, of food also. I, I think it's also really, really relevant. 
and there is a huge difference, as you mentioned, uh, when we talk about more like technical aspects of our lives. Um, yes, uh, so the food system is broken. Uh, I also did my homework a little bit, and uh, and and and. Uh, uh, I, I just want to get your feedback also. Um, uh, are you like heard read the same, and uh, are you aware of this kind of impact that, that the food system has on our planet? Um, so I, I, I read uh, from from the reports that uh, beef uh, production then is is the leading driver of deforestation. Um, agriculture occupies forty percent of global land. Food production is responsible to 30% of global greenhouse gas emissions and 70% of fresh water use. Um, and land conversion for food production is the single most important driver of biodiversity loss. Then we have also blooming of the seas and water bodies due to the um, uh, abundance of nutrients that uh, the agriculture is, is, is using. Uh, we have agrochemicals in groundwater already. Uh, we have plastic pollution that also uh, in a very big part comes from uh, the food system. Uh, the fishing nets, for example. I mean, plastic bottles in a way are also part of our food system. So that's the, that's the packaging delivering part of the food system. Um, also, the nutritional value seems to be decreasing in uh, uh, in the food products that we have um, and uh, and also in the end like uh, the the issue is very much about diversity uh, there is insufficient diversity uh, from the plates uh, in our menus down to the field how the uh, food is produced so we could really consider that it is broken and uh, now there are several ways how to fix it. Um, but first, I mean, f from the audience, uh, if you want to reflect uh, wh what you just heard from the panel and, and these little facts that I brought up here, um, are you aware of this impact of the food system in general? Do, do you agree that the food system is broken as it is functioning nowadays? Like if if someone wants, so you you can you can nod or you can applaud or you can stand up and say no. <laughs> no yeah. Well, well, maybe people are still preparing. I need. I know that in Latvia we need to give a bit. Yeah, of yeah, time. yeah. That's I fine. I yeah. wanted to add one more uh, fact from the discussion before on one health. It was also said that forty percent of the total antibiotics consumption is in animal sector. Yeah, yeah, yeah so exactly. Just yeah. That. yeah, and these antibiotics will then circle uh, in in our water bodies, in our soils, and eventually, of course, get to us, so that we, we don't have to get a prescription from family doctor anymore. We we have a constant flow. And maybe um, I add another fact: the conversion rate in animal protein is for one kilogram of animal protein, and here I'm referring basically to meat protein, you have to feed six kilograms of protein. So the conversion rate is also very poor. Yeah, that's, that's quite yeah. bad, yeah. I think it, if, if it's the same would happen in energy, uh, <laughs> we would be living in colds. <laughs> black hydrogen, kind of, you can yeah. compare it to this black hydrogen. Um, but, but let us now come to the toolbox that we have. Uh, one thing, obviously, is that we change our diets. We start consuming less of the things that have big impact on our food system. Uh, but we then also have other things on, on the toolbox. We have novel foods. We have uh, uh, plant-based uh, meat. We have uh, uh, yeah, other meat alternatives. Uh, and we have, of, of course, more sustainable agribusiness models. Um, I would suggest we, we take the, the, the most difficult one uh, in the first place, um, changing our menus, right? <laughs> um, and uh, here again, as, as I read, uh, the, the report that I'm referring to, if you want to know, is, is called, uh, uh, it's a joint report uh, between the EAT Foundation and, and Lancet. Lancet is the um, most 
prominent medical uh, academic uh, journal. And uh, the scientific consensus at the moment um, is that dietary shifts are the biggest leverage we have to reduce emissions and other damage caused by our food system. So the, the science is out saying that, uh, that the most efficient thing is when we change our diets. Um, and I think here is when, when it gets tricky. Um, what, what, what do you make of it? Uh, um, the changing of our diets. I just give you um, an example to, uh, to, to um, carry it on. Um, the same Eat Foundation Lancet uh, Commission report also suggested kind of a um, planetary health global menu, like food guidelines. Um, and w when I looked into that menu, uh, for example, uh, a person is then suggested um, to have 100 grams of beef, lamb or pork, 200 grams of chicken, 200 grams of fish, uh, quite a lot of dairy products still, and this is all per week, not per day, 100 grams of pork and beef. Uh, and the rest of it is, is like uh, uh, legumes, uh, grains, uh, vegetables, fruits, nuts, all, all these things. So wh what do you make of this? I have also heard that the, the Nordic food uh, guidelines are out a uh, little bit towards the same direction. There is a drastic uh, reduction of uh, meat consumption. Would people actually like to have that kind of menu and, and uh, how, how we go about this in this society? So we can start, whoever likes. <laughs> yes, there are those guidelines and um, it's very complex uh, still to really induce any dietary change. And also what we have, re or another uh, researchers have found out that uh, as long as you label something as healthy or healthier diet, it's uh, immediately associated as less tasty. And we have to not forget that food is part of a great enjoyment in life. So how can we talk about uh, healthy food without losing any part of aspect of tastiness. And I think that's uh, maybe the biggest problem of the guidelines everywhere because uh, it's good for health, it's good for environment, but the data on uh, type two diabetes or cardiovascular uh, diseases shows something else. And then on one hand we have the guidelines, maybe also healthy and tasty food. On the other hand, we have so-called food deserts, when, when uh, deserts, I mean, like safari, <laughs> not safari, but Sahara. And uh, so uh, where maybe nearby you, you can only buy something not healthy or it's easy, accessible, not that healthy food. And then will you really spend a lot of your time? Will you really walk, let's say, or, or drive? Or, or try to reach more healthy food if uh, at your convenience is just unhealthy food. Mm -hmm. But but th this uh, tasting you refer to, um, so you mean that uh, if, for example, some, some people have developed uh, um, a taste for meat, so if, if they are somehow, I don't know, prohibited or the meat will be more expensive, so that they are desiring this meat taste, uh, this this is what what you mean not 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 particularly uh, that that for example if a vegetarian dish is, is prepared in a very tasteful way but still they they sort of miss the taste of certain fish or meat products we see from eit uh, f consumer observation that food consumers are extremely conservative and and this is an answer to your question that you want to kind of you are not very into trying new new things, you stick to what you know and don't want to really change uh, the way or what you consume. So maybe. Okay, changing of the menus. 
Yeah. 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 If I may to bring in an aspect uh, that is price of the of the diet so that you just uh, mm, brought brought forward. What is a healthy diet? What does it consist of? But uh, how much does it cost? And it's more a question than a statement. I'm not sure. I don't have the right answer. But isn't it so that in some cases? Mm, uh, the prefabricated food that can be grasped from uh, from local uh, um, store is uh, just uh, cheaper. Not only that it is uh, much more available, uh, but it's just cheaper. And it's a question of purchasing power. Uh, of course, uh, one can always claim that uh, vegetables uh, are the cheapest uh, elements or things in, in the in the store at all if you buy some uh, cabbage for example it's it's pretty pretty cheap uh, yeah but uh, uh, it's a big jump to go from uh, from uh, mm, non-healthy menu to only eating cabbage and and uh, and carrots you need to kind of gradually move into it and and uh, or, or perhaps not uh, reach the final destination at all, but but rather have some. I mean, eating only only vegetables is probably uh, rather radical. But I'm I'm not <laughs> I'm not an expert in this. So uh, what I want to s to to uh, give a thought upon is that uh, perhaps one of the obstacles that we are facing is that the healthy diet might be more expensive in some cases, and it's a question of purchasing power. Uh, uh, power of, uh, of the society that limits uh, the shift to a healthier diet, to some est extent mm. at least, uh, as you mentioned, Madis, that it would be a big leverage to better food system if uh, everybody changes uh, his or her diet, definitely. But uh, it's not. But it might not only be the question of uh, habits and cultural norms, it might also be a question of money. Mm. I, it's like in America, for example, yeah, I mean, uh, you can you can feed your own, own uh, entire family with with burgers and fries, get it really cheaply. But instead uh, instead going to the uh, grocery store, buying all the fresh stuff, uh, it will be often like twice as expensive for the family to have a meal. And then obviously that there is a case. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. So if if I can also complement, so. When we are talking about food, there are several must-have factors. Of course, the food should be safe, nutritious, and da-da-da. But then it has to be affordable. It has to be tasty. And when we look at these current alternatives, majority of them are at least double the price of any meat product, like like the meatballs. Yeah, the meatballs are, are ra rather cheap. If you compare it with the plant-based or then the uh, fungi-based ones, or the if you go even to more sophisticated, obviously there are these novel foods which are not yet approved in Europe, but elsewhere they are approved. They are even much more expensive. So coming to what, what has been pointed out, yes, the the price is, is quite critical, plus the taste. If it doesn't taste good, you cannot win the general population. Here we are not really, yeah. shouldn't be focusing on vegetarians or, or vegans or flexitarians mm. because they already have this attitude uh, to, to uh, reduce the meat consumption or totally eliminate it. If I might give another example, not related to protein topic, but more of a pain point for the Western countries, for the Nordics, for the Baltics, is that we have a huge dietary fiber intake problem. There has been at least three decades of work, scientific work done on whole grain consumption and how it affects our health. There is a direct link between whole grain and certain cancers, for example, colon cancer, and still, uh, the intake of dietary fiber or whole grain products is much lower than the recommended levels. And this they is don't taste good. related to taste <laughs> and price. If you go to go and buy a bread which is yep. made with white wheat flour, it's less than one euro versus if you buy sourdough fermented whole grain bread, 
it is at minimum three, four euros. Yeah, but also take rice, for example. I mean, most of really like this, uh, um, you know, jasmine rice and then white rice compared to the brown rice. Mm. Well, <laughs> it's expensive and it doesn't And it's expensive also, yeah. But uh, I, I think this price thing, this is maybe a little bit of uh, um, um, certain sectors in, in the food system, uh, the environmental costs are not factored in, right? Th this is the, how you could the valley school. Externali externalities, externalities are, are not uh, taking into account. Definitely, absolutely. And, and, and if these were taking into account, then definitely also yeah, uh, then eating a burger would be more expensive than definitely making Definitely, the comparative prices would change in the system, but then uh, the, the low-income families, uh, their situation might become even worse. So they have uh, much worse uh, access to, to food at all, not just healthy food. Uh, at the same uh, time, yeah. I just want to add, at the same time, it's also difficult to market vegan and vegetarian food because you cannot set the price as high as you can set it for the steak. And people want to treat themselves and want to spend. Well, we are talking about very polarized uh, society. And, and then also comes in the issues that you cannot really price uh, the vegetables as high as you can set the price for the yeah, meat. Yeah. Yeah. Petri, uh, your take on, on changing the menus uh, for the yeah, for the good uh, of the planet. I, I think price is definitely one, one aspect, but maybe we should ask from the uh, audience as well that uh, what is the main reason why, why we don't change our, our diet? Um, I guess habits. Would you, yeah, that's, that's a good question, I think. Would you be willing, for example, to change your diet towards more plant-based, maybe even following a little bit of the global guidelines that I uh, told you before? Uh, you, can, you can raise your hands. Who's like in favor of eating less meat? Hmm. Quite, quite, quite many, actually. Yeah. Who, who likes uh, to eat meat, by the way? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It's just that maybe, maybe uh, th there were not too many meat lovers, and then everyone raised their hands that yes, yes, I'm ready to change. <laughs> but it, it is totally okay to love eating meat. There are, for example, for our health, it's very important to take those essential amino acids which you cannot take fully from the plant-based sources. So for those, you need animal proteins and meat is one of those sources. The problem here is that you don't need to eat 100 kilograms <laughs> of meat per, <laughs> per year or, or, or per couple of months. So that's, that's the problem. And of course, changing the attitudes of the people are very difficult. Changing the consumer behavior is extremely challenging, but we have to start no, from but this somewhere. No, but this audience, I mean, half of the audience was ready to change. <laughs> I would maybe a little bit argue here as well that uh, different plants have different, like, um, uh, protein composition, so meaning that uh, you have a different nutritional value in, in different uh, plants, and some plants are actually very well uh, replacing uh, meat protein as well. Um, and but for example, our I guess here in, in Estonia we don't maybe know that well what to do with uh, beans or legends. That uh, we don't we haven't we don't have the tradition to yeah. Uh, to yeah use them in, in our food. Mm. If you go to India, for example, uh, there are large regions of uh, areas where where people are vegans and and they are living very healthy life there. So uh, it's about yeah, changing our habits. And um, one way how industry is trying to, to help there is, to, is exactly to uh, make food that mimics meat. Um, I can say that the, the first example that have been in, uh, in market uh, have not been maybe the best. There is still room for improvement, but uh, I'm sure this was just the first generation of products and the next generations will be better. And, uh, also, there was a discussion that people like the taste of, uh, of meat, so it's uh, mainly, you can break it down as well, and it's the umaminess of the, of the food, and also mm, heme, or the iron, is giving this good taste. But uh, there are ways um, how to produce those 
Also B, uh, vitamin B12 is something that uh, you mainly get from meat, but there are more and more uh, novel foods available as well which provide those nutrients. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, I, I think this field is therefore changing now. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I think we come back to these novel foods uh, r right away, uh, a little bit more closer even. Yeah? Yeah, Maya? I just wanted to add that um, somehow what we are talking right now is a side product of modernity, or <laughs> let's say electricity, because we have lost the seasonality of how we consume things. So there has been always some uh, period when you don't consume uh, meat, and then it's maybe a short time when you do that. And of course, now we can access, uh, if we can afford uh, everything all the time. And I think this loss of seasonality, of course, is an issue, and we haven't managed it good as a society overall. So that was just uh, this add-on. Yeah, yeah. I, I would I also... Um emphasize that it's not only about meat. Um, in the food sector, uh, we should um, consume more locally produced foods, right? Because the transportation is the big issue with a lot of carbon emissions uh, originating from, from food transportation from other parts of the, of the world. Uh, then packaging is a big issue. So it was uh, uh, great to see that uh, so many of you raised hands uh, whether you are ready to, to cut meat in your diets, but uh, what about uh, growing some, uh, some uh, food yourself uh, instead of uh, relying on, on stores and supermarkets to buy it, to buy it from, or perhaps to participate in a, in a uh, food cooperative uh, for, for joint production um, for your... Um, vegetables for winter, for example, et, et cetera. So, um, and uh, it is kind of controversial uh, thing for me either because we all come from the Soviet era. We know about the cooperatives. We have the not so good experience, uh, saying it mildly. And I've heard so many green transition uh, uh, evangelists uh, talking that uh, how our food system is going to be uh, uh, redeemed by uh, food growing, uh, by, by the cooperatives, by the collectivization and collective uh, growing of, of, of plants and, and perhaps even animals, or perhaps not. Anyway, um, uh, it is one of the things that, uh, this is one of the, um, cure to the broken food system that is seen uh, in the literature, that we should rely more on the local food production cooperatives, but uh, talking about in it uh, in Estonia or in other uh, former Soviet states, it's uh, kind of, I mean, um, how come or, or what are you talking about? So, so this is perhaps one aspect too. And uh, I was recently in the Acad Academy of Sciences uh, having a lecture for the master students and um, <coughs> uh, there was big, as you mentioned previously, whether people are ready to sacrifice air travel. So let no air travel at all. Uh, let's, uh, let's drive by buses, let's drive by rail uh, or by boat, but not air. And there was a heavy discussion. So for, uh, for example, some claimed that, but perhaps uh, during vacation it's still okay and uh, we cut all business travel but uh, we, we would like to retain the vacation, uh, vacational air travel. And then I just uh, uh, brought into the discussion that okay, we are already so polarized about air travel uh, or, or curbing air travel. What about uh, growing your own food? Uh, are you ready to do this? And this was absolutely out of the question. None of the, of the, of the young youngsters wanted to do that. So I mean, um, we, we, we are not yet in the, in, the, uh, in the round of recipes, so how to cure the broken food system, but I just see that uh, perhaps the cure that Petri is offering just is a novel food, uh, which is a great uh, way out uh, uh, until it uh, is affordable in price. <laughs> I mean, as, as soon as it is affordable in price for the population. Uh, but uh, quite many of the, of the cures that we are offered uh, seem a bit... Uh, Odd, I would say, not the, not your one, but uh, but many of the rest. Thank you. Uh, if uh, I, I let you continue, just just one thing, I, I I need to correct, not to not to let it uh, uh, be circling here. When it comes to the transportation of food, food miles, sometimes referred, um, th there are actually quite many myth myths about uh, food transportation. We we often think that uh, shipping in. Um, foodstuffs uh, uh, from abroad 
uh, has a huge impact compared to what we locally produce. Um, actually, the, the transportation part might be really, really small. Um, and uh, where the emissions come actually are other places, are, are the uh, direct uh, production, farming, uh, related to, if it's related to animals. Um, okay, so it's okay to, to get uh, your uh, uh, lenses from India, for example? Uh, if, I mean, uh, you compare uh, having the lenses uh, uh, farmed in Estonia, and then you compare it uh, to India, you also have to look at uh, other factors. But definitely, I mean, it's, it's not the case that, for example, you say uh, the, the food miles are, are so great that uh, uh, I, I rather uh, consume locally produced beef rather than having my avocados and, and, and lentils from India. Because there, when you compare the different uh, food uh, items, then uh, the issue is what you consume, not that much of where it comes from. For example, in, in the beef production, uh, when it's the specific uh, beef herd, not the dairy uh, herd beef, uh, then the transportation actually from the entire emissions of the beef is 0.5%. And, and usually across the other uh, food items, it usually stays uh, below 10%. So it, it, it should be, uh, yeah, take, but take but a I note. I think what Thea was maybe thinking, and what we are also increasingly thinking of, is this uh, food systems in terms of resilience and security. And there, I think, it comes into play this question, what can we grow locally, regionally, and how the si food system is functioning. And in our project, Future of Urban Agriculture, we looked at how cities can actually participate in this all food growing kind of uh, and food consumption area. And it's, uh, it was really nice to find out that Helsinki, they have a map of an edible city. So you know where is the apple tree, where is uh, some berries maybe, where are some mushrooms. And I think we increasingly need to think about these uh, edible city maps. And, but when it comes to really, really growing food, well, on balcony, maybe somewhere on the roof, these systems are not yet in place. And, and also this hydroponics and all of but this. These urban gardens? Urban gardens. Collective are, gardens. Yes, they are collective gardens, unless they are gated <laughs> communities. I mean, how open are they are to the whole society, uh, and, uh, who, who can access and who cannot access. So uh, urban gardens are definitely a way forward, and it's also interesting how some activists in Lithuania have, for example, illegally taken land and set up an urban garden. So it's kind of these mov movements are happening, but still we don't really see the necessary scale of how city can offer some kind of solution because we are growingly urbanized society. So what's the role of the cities here? I have a question to the audience. I, I have also a follow-up <laughs> question, go but, but you go first. Yeah. <laughs> this time I go first. So uh, we have been talking about meat and we have been talking about vegetables and increasing the plant-based foods in our diet. One way of doing it is obviously vegetables and fruits and uh, root vegetables, potatoes, carrots, and so on. My question is, how many of you are cooking own food starting from scratch? I mean, really buying the potatoes and carrots and peas and beans and also your meat and invest time in the kitchen, starting from scratch, and cooking your own food. I'm impressed, but this is not, uh, I guess, a, <laughs> a, a normal group. Majority of the people, because we are lacking time, and, and unfortunately the, the amount that is spent together with the family in the dining table is going down and down, mm. and not everyone knows how to operate with lentils, with uh, yeah. root vegetables. They don't know how to cook, and it takes time. When it comes to especially plant-based food, you need to process it so that you don't get the stomach discomfort. And majority of the population 
has this problem. So there is the irritable bowel syndrome. There are also certain allergens that comes from the plant-based foods. And for those, you need to know how to operate. And, and unfortunately, the consumers don't know this. So that's why we need processing. We need to process the Yeah, food. but let's come back to uh, processed foods. Let's uh, uh, like define that, novel foods. And then you also get to say if you're ready to eat these kind of things that they are going to describe. Uh, but uh, as you are a really extraordinary audience here, uh, ready to change a menu and cook at home, um, th then I have this follow-up question. Um, as, 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 I, as I read, um, there is an accumulated body of evidence showing the clear link between high intake of uh, red meat and, and certain uh, diseases, uh, like heart disease, cancer, and diabetes. Um, you, you were saying that uh, uh, you would like to change your menu or you're ready to do that. Um, would it be primarily on a health reasons or on an environmental reasons because this type of food having a uh, big impact? So who is willing to do that for their own personal health reasons? And for the planet? You like planet more than yourselves. <laughs> that's interesting. That's that's really interesting. Yeah, thanks. Uh, but uh, I would now like to continue as we, we were discussing about changing the menus. And there are food uh, guidelines out, uh, regional food guidelines from the Nordics, uh, now even global guidelines. And, and uh, we brought up some issues here with uh, uh, like challenges here, changing the menu, starting from price and, and, and taste and, and uh, lack of skills and all those things. Um, but there is another big venue uh, that might come uh, handy when uh, trying to fix the food system. And this is uh, the novel foods. Um, I would need a little bit of help here. Uh, what is novel foods? And uh, what's the benefit that they would bring us? Uh, I, can, I can start with a definition. So uh, in Europe, uh, novel food is defined as a food that has not been extensively consumed in Europe by Europeans before, uh, I'm forgetting the date, but uh, June 1997. Yeah. Uh, so, um, yeah, it's, it's just uh, a specific date when the law was accepted and uh, everything uh, that was consumed before that is not novel food. And uh, you, you bring some examples, obviously, of novel food now for yeah, us. It's it's a good point. I, I should know some, <laughs> some very common ones, but I, I cannot. Uh, uh, yeah. Can Insects. I you? Yeah, go yeah. ahead. Yeah. So an example is um, rapeseed protein. Sorry, what? Rapeseed protein. Grape so seed. Rape seed. Grape seed rape. protein. Okay. I can say the Finnish properly. In, in which? It's the same. Rupsi, rapsi. Yeah, yeah, okay. In, so in which, which, which uh, type it, of form it, it, you it intake it? If it's a protein that is extracted from rapeseed, it's novel food. But if you eat uh, rapeseed or rapeseed oil, it is not novel food. So oh. there is a little bit of, uh, <laughs> uh, how would I say, uh, things that doesn't make sense in the in the novel foods regulation. Mm. Yeah. Right? For, for example, also uh, chia seeds. They had not been consumed previously in, in by Europeans, so uh, they are considered as novel food and they had mm. to go through all this uh, regulatory hurdle. Okay, I, I was immediately thinking of those insects and stuff as novel food. They have been approved nowadays, so yeah. they, but it's the, if you eat the whole insect flour, it's it has been approved for human mm -hmm. consumption now. It went through the novel foods regulation. Okay. But if you want to consume an insect protein, it's still in the process. So yeah, it is yeah, not... Yeah. Uh, but for example, when we now come to these uh, 
plant-based meat they products. Are not novel foods. They are not novel they foods. Not. That's why I wanted okay. to correct yeah. this uh, kind of Thanks. plant-based yeah. meat. They are not novel food. Mm -hmm. Cultured meat, it's novel food, but plant-based okay. is not novel mm -hmm. food. But and there is also GMO food, but I will not even go there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But when we when we now look into these. Um, um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't mind. I, I just say, and you can you can define. But um, uh, the, the alternative of you know eating meat is we know these plant-based uh, alternatives, mm -hmm. and and the critique that I have heard is that okay, that's fine. They might even uh, become tasty, uh, as as uh, Petri also mentioned that this is just the first generation that's out there. It, it, it will be better, um, but the critique there is. Uh, uh, that this is a uh, very processed food, like ultra processed food. Um, uh, Nestle Petri, maybe maybe you can shed light here, like this processed food thing. Um, wh yeah. wh what is it? What does it mean? Yeah. And what what's the what's the hurdles there? So uh, I'm I'm still <laughs> standing on the same uh, or saying the same that uh, it's still the first generation that we are providing. So. Uh, the task has been to make something that uh, uses only plants, mimics uh, meat, and uh, would be edible, kind of. So, so the criteria initially probably weren't that high, and uh, and also then to make it taste a little bit better, uh, yeah, the uh, industry is putting in a lot of thing, different things, and to make it uh, uh, also to yeah durable. So the but products are getting better and better. There are more and more uh, products on the market as well that have maybe five, six ingredients only and are less uh, processed. But, um, but yeah, processing is, is another uh, thing that, um, in my opinion, there is a big dif or at least, let's say, to the public, there is a big difference if the processing is taking place at home or in the industry. So if the processing is taking place in the industry, then it's bad. But if you do it at home, put a lot of salt, fry it in, in, in butter, and then it's a little bit burnt as well because it gives a nice crispiness to your product or to your food, then, then it's fine. Or but in, but, but in can I come in here with, with an observation that, uh, for example, if I um, buy, um, th these are like, I don't know, pre-cooked, um, like minced meat, um, how you call it, cutlets, yeah? Uh, seasoned, uh, they, ha they are cooked, so pretty much you just put them on a pan and warm them up. So if I, and also add butter if I like, yeah? But if I now compare this with uh, fresh minced meat that I season myself at home and fry in a butter, uh, I suppose there still is a difference because this uh, uh, ready-made in in, uh, in a factory uh, has already been processed, cooled down. Now I do it again. The fat composition must change somehow. Or I must correct here now. Yes, something. yes, please. <laughs> what you are talking about is not really the processing. What you are talking about is the composition, is the formulation, is the nutritional content, and this is what we should be discussing. I know there has been huge discussions going on around ultra processed foods, how bad they are for you, and so on and so forth. Partly they are correct, mostly they are incorrect or misleading. Let me give you an example. If you take uh, minced meat versus the plant-based plant alternative, in the, if you eat a um, uh, minced meat product produced at home. You put salt, you put butter, and so on and so forth, and it's minimally processed in a way at home. Is it really healthy and nutritious? Does it give you all the elements that you need? Versus take a, a plant-based meat alternative, but here you have to be careful with the nutritional composition, because with the plant-based meat alternatives, some of them are made by using palm oil or coconut oil that has even much more saturated fats than the actual animal lard, animal fat. 
has. Or some of them, in order to close the, the sensory gap, uh, the taste, it has been, there has been added lots of uh, salt. Uh, and, and this makes it an unhealthy product. But there are those meat alternatives which are made by using, uh, for example, fermentation to give the umami taste to it naturally. They bring together with the protein different kind of vitamins because it goes through fermentation. And then it can also bring dietary fiber to your diet. So it is not really how you process. Another example is bread. You can make bread, which is almost empty in calories, lots of starch in it, but exactly the same process, you can make a high fiber bread. The cereals that you are consuming, we use extrusion processing, this is a little bit technical terminology, but exactly the same process, you can make a very healthy, all fiber cereal, or you can make a Rice crisp, which has lots of sugar and artificial flavors in it. The process is exactly the same. It's the nutritional composition that's different and the consumer should pay attention to the nutritional composition. Maybe one quick thing to add uh, would be that probably most of the traditional food that we are consuming would not pass the novel food regulatory part. Especially we, we talk about meat because they are con uh, containing antibiotics and, and all this stuff. Uh, so if you produce novel food, then you could never use anything like that. And that's why we have uh, language wars, because meat producers don't want that these new alternatives are called, let's say, uh, for example, milk, oat milk. Yeah, It's so much easier to add to your coffee oat milk than oat juice. and. Mm -hmm. It's again, uh, it's quite a battle, and I think one of the problems for these novel foods is actually how do we name them? How do we talk about them? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, like, can I just uh, clarify, Nestle, this, this one thing? I, I'm still a little bit confused with this processing part here. For example, if, if I now um, buy this uh, plant based meat product, I haven't actually, I, 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 don't, know how, I don't know how it tastes. But uh, uh, let's say that it uh, it consists of uh, I don't know oats. Uh, there are some chickpeas maybe, and some flavorings and stuff. Yeah. But what they have done is that they have done these extrusion processes. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's, that's so so, so they they have this thing now. They have and structured and it in a way that it has similar texture than meat. As meat has this nice you know structure that yeah 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> so 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 th this is it and on the other hand I I could make my uh, vegetarian beef uh, also when I just uh, put it in in a kitchen uh, mixer uh, chickpeas uh, I don't know beetroot and then the fry it. Not be the same. Exactly. It not be the same. Exactly. So th that's why I'm referring to that. W what I make at home, just crushing it vegetables, yeah, you and can then never this. Do uh, it at, at home. But then yeah, yeah. But but the difference here between I is there a difference um, in in the sake of the human health? Yes, there is a difference. So the difference is that when we have done research on the protein, when you are talking about protein, digestibility is very important, and there is no debate on this. Animal proteins have high digestibility. With animal proteins, I am referring to meat, milk, and egg. They, they are fully utilized by your body. When it comes to plant-based proteins, they are inferior. They are not as good digestible as the animal proteins. But with processing, we have done a comparison between chicken, pork meat, and then those different kinds of plant-based or then also uh, fungi-based proteins which went through this extrusion processing and they have similar protein digestibility. So, so you claim so you that need, this processing, processing part actually gives extra benefits. Exactly. Yeah. All right. That's, uh, well, that's interesting. It, yeah. it was just as nicely illustrated. Bread, it can be Healthy can also be not healthy. Processing as such as a process can lead to more healthy 
uh, alternatives, and it can also mean, as it was mentioned, use of palm oil and uh, too much of salt. It's so formulation. It it's the ingredients. It yeah. depends how you do it. Mm. Uh, but Petri, I, I would really like to come back to um, this um, spectacular thing that you do uh, in your startup. Um, could you please explain what, what kind of uh, food stuff you are producing and how you do that? Yeah, we we are take, have taken up a challenge to produce alternative fats. So uh, alternative protein has been a big thing already for decades. And, uh, and then came the problem that uh, if you're producing protein, uh, just eating a bo protein powder is not very uh, nice um, and tasty. So you need actually every food needs some uh, fat as well. But where can you get uh, sustainable uh, fats? And uh, today, uh, the most used uh, plant-based uh, fat is palm oil. Uh, and we know that the production of palm oil it's increasing and it's not uh, sustainable. So uh, we came up with a technology how to produce fats uh, in a more sustainable way. And we are using uh, biotechnology, meaning that we are using microbes. So the process is very similar to brewing beer or, or making wine. You have uh, yeast that can consume some type of sugars and uh, convert them, well, in, in uh, brewing, it, uh, the yeast forms ethanol or alcohol, but uh, our yeast is producing fats. And uh, our yeast is uh, special in a way that it can use actually various different type of uh, sugars, so it doesn't need uh, grape juice to produce uh, wine, or, but uh, we can use, for example, sugars from uh, sawdust or agri mm. agricultural side streams. So, um, so you fed sawdust to your microbes that are like your farmers in a way, right? Yeah. And, <laughs> and then they produce you fat. fat. Yeah. That's marvelous. Would you buy that kind of fat in the shop? How <laughs> does uh, how does the final product look like? Is it like a uh, package of? Uh, it's like a fat. Okay. Like <laughs> I see. <laughs> I see. The, I mean see. the industry would say, okay, you cannot use uh, the name fat. How would you call it? You, in a sense, you can because it has exactly the same composition. So you can, of course, design the composition. We also know that there are good fats and bad fats, and uh, we can uh, we can design what type of fats we want. So uh, and there is, of course, a trade-off as well that uh, not all good fats have the properties uh, that we want to see in our food. So usually, the healthy fats are are liquid. And uh, sometimes we need solid fats as well. So, uh, but we can dim it in a way that it uh, has the texture that uh, is needed, but is not as bad for your health, for example. But when going to uh, to the store, uh, I'm I'm not normally buying fat. I buy butter, for example. Which is fat. I yeah. see. But the would name, you call your product name, butter? Yes. Uh, I believe we are not allowed to call it a butter. Mm. But that's again the. Uh, the uh, part where we are discussing mm. the definitions and how, how things, uh, this novel food, should be actually called. Yeah. Do you have some ideas? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we are calling our product cultivated fat. So, uh, yeah. But if I. It sounds bad, huh? <laughs> <laughs> cultivated fat. It's like lab grown meat almost. Well, uh, I mean, uh, not, not that bad, but. <laughs> uh, I think the correct term for lab grown fat. meat today is also cultivated yeah. meat. So mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. cultivation, yeah. well, we I, are I think it really comes back to what, what, what Maya said that this, this language and that this yeah. sort of sense of food yeah. that, that might really play a critical role. If I can give another benefit of this kind of microbial lipid production, that's how we call it at VTT, uh, is that you give the example butter, how it is different than, than butter. With this kind of new food producing technologies, actually, you have the flexibility to play with functional properties. With functional properties, I mean, when you put butter in a pan, and if you s let it wait, it starts to smoke, right? The smoke point in butter, olive oil, probably you, you would agree that olive oil is one of the most healthiest oils but that's very bad for cooking because it has a low smoke point 
and then when you use it for cooking purposes, similar to butter, it will cause carcinogenic compounds. So by using microbes for lipid production or fat production, you have the flexibility to play with these functional properties so that they are more nutritious. And when you use the word fat, it immediately you know, gives the negative signs. But our brain needs fat. No, it's good. Uh, it's good. <laughs> but, but, but your smoke point of your uh, uh, cultivated fat then? So it, it, we can change it based on what kind of properties we want. That's cool. <laughs> uh, do you have any questions? Um, yes, uh, you, can, you can ask if uh, we can hear. It's fine. But it's streamed, so you get a mic. It's there. Hello. Uh, thank you for the interesting uh, conversation. I have uh, this question that you also have uh, brought up a little, that there are like lots of myths and stuff we like think differently about about food. So what is the best place to seek like the most correct information? Not TikTok. But that's a super good uh, question. Maybe, Nestle, you wanted to continue. <laughs> where, well, where this, to this is actually <laughs> among I mean, even, even science is contradicting once in a while, so I don't know. <laughs> well, I think we have to, we scientists need to communicate our results in, in layman terms more with the, with the, uh, with the general public. Uh, there, there is a lot to be done there. and, and the thing is that everyone has something to say about food, right? Because everyone is eating food and, and, and it's so dear and everyone has very strong opinions about food. So that's why there is no single resource that I would say, okay, go ahead, you read this. But definitely I can say that TikTok is not the, is not the place place for that. I have been also recently seeing lots of things about water intake and I see people walking with gallons really yes. of water. I mean yeah <laughs> so much of this misinformation, disinformation and it's uh, at the end uh, somebody is profiting from these uh, weird stories that they are being sold to you. Uh, where to find? I still would like to go back to this um, Nordic nutritional guidelines. I think this is maybe something safe. There are some safe options to, to which you can trust uh, and um, look at the local Do you know the page number of Nordic nutritional recommendations? The, the number of what? No, page number. How many pages uh, you need to read? It's quite, but no, it's quite a bit. Nowadays, you you know how to shorten the content easily. Chat GPT. You have to first eat a lot, <laughs> and then you can read the report. But this is a very valid question. I think everybody of us is asking: Am I reading a myth? Is this uh, valid information? Is this relevant or true also in our region, and so on and so forth. I would say that challenge whatever you are reading. Yes. Use your own own brain and and challenge it. And I think maybe a good good thing could be you know those textbooks that you have you went through during your high school years and and uh, and so on. They are this. I mean, 0 0.83 grams per kilogram weight for a healthy adult. There you go. Uh, so, sorry, how much? 0 0.83 grams per kilogram body weight for a healthy adult. Ah. Does it, uh, if I may, just a question out of curiosity. I, I've uh, learned a lot already today here. Thank you. Thank you for all this. Uh, you mentioned they, these are the Nordic guidelines. Uh, does do the guidelines depend on the region uh, on the on the map in the world, so that in colder climate you should actually get more animal proteins? We in Latvia recently had really interesting um, uh, workshop. It's online on our webpage, Norden.lv. It was about food resilience. Also, how do you act in ca case of uh, food crisis? 
And there was very interesting also presentation of uh, Sami food resilience, which of course also, and, uh, and more and more also research from Nord Radio, uh, Nordic Council of Mises, we can see that it really takes into account uh, the geographical, local economic uh, economies, and it's definitely not one medicine fits all. It's more most reasonable, most nutritious, and also planetary friendly approach. And, and nowadays with this complexity we can deal much better because we have data, we have uh, complex algorithms, so we can actually somehow navigate in this uh, complexity. Yeah, yeah but as far as I know it more takes into account what can you actually produce locally mm -hmm. that uh, mm -hmm. maybe these uh, exotic fruits are not available in the north, so uh, we should maybe not put it in a diet, we could uh, but, but just, uh, I mean, what I was uh, having in mind is that you have to resist more cold temperatures than people in the southern part of, of the world. Does this play a role? I mean, in a way, it's, it's e about energy, right? I, if you need to resist harsh uh, climate conditions, you need energy for that. And, and then it's the question, like, where the energy comes from? More chocolate. Fat. <laughs> <laughs> Carbohydrates. Yeah, but when it comes to regional aspects, like for instance, when you are giving the recommendations for this region, for the Nordics, it's like eat, you know, one bowl of berries per day, right? You cannot give this kind of recommendation in India. Yeah, that's so so yeah. it's also related to when you are guiding people, mm. of course, you cannot expect a general consumer to, to calculate, okay, how much of berries I should eat so that I can get X percentage of my dietary fiber intake. So you need to pay attention that, you know, what is available in that region and what is familiar to the consumer. So for that reason, this regionality is, is important. And another kind of trend and where we all will end up, I think, in five or ten years, it's uh, really this precision. Precision medicine, precision health. So maybe uh, in some future you will understand exactly what your uh, metabolism needs most. So you will be very exact and the food will be like the medicine because now it acts more like a poison as we see from the health data. So if we move forward this precision uh, medicine, then we will be quite, quite exact. But of course, again, the question, is there diagnostic and is there solution. Maybe we will live in the world where diagnostic will be, but there will be no uh, infrastructure for solutions. So I think maybe that's more realistic scenario, but still we will be more knowledgeable, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I actually had uh, um, uh, one more aspect about our food systems, uh, but uh, I don't know how, how tired you are. I'm not going to get paid for that, so I, I can also leave earlier. <laughs> but uh, it, it was about sustainable agriculture, like business models. And, and uh, on the one hand, we hear that uh, some of our food production will move to biorefineries. So we, uh, the new farmers will be bacteria and microbes, and the food will come from biorefineries. Um, it might sound a little bit uh, daunting in the first place, but um, but I mean, hearing that uh, how it actually resembles the traditional brewing process, maybe it's not that bad. Um, I actually, I mean, this process is so cool. You take sawdust and and create fat. <laughs> That's just marvelous. Um, I mean, I if you, we have ten minutes. Um, if you can bear still with us, uh, I would like to take uh, shortly this uh, sustainable agribusiness models because it seems that at least some things we still need to grow <coughs> on the fields um, and how to do that so that we don't kill our planet. All these fermentation made products they need sugar. Yeah. For sugar you need the land, you need the farmer. No, sawdust. So well, too. well, majority of them rely, rely, relies on sugar, and then uh, actually sawdust is used as a carbohydrate source for the fermentation. But this will give another business model also for the farmer. When you grow vegetables and fruits, there is always some sort of, or grains, 
side stream that comes, the leaves or the stalks and, and so on. So those can be converted into more valuable products such as proteins and so on. So we, we need to think about new business models. We yeah, and, and actually I, I could also bring one, uh, one case that, uh, that was really interesting reading. Uh, it's a book uh, called, um, um, it was in Estonian, I don't know in English, maybe it's from dust to soil. Yeah, It's, it's by Gabe Brown, an American farmer, uh, regenerative agriculture. And uh, uh, as we have learned here today, this uh, industrial meat production is really heavy on the environment. Uh, um, many other um, like ecosystem degradation uh, with, with the traditional agriculture. But for example, if you take the case of, of this farmer, he's been uh, trying out and practicing uh, three decades and uh, I think if we would try to measure the emissions and the impact of his farm, then we also get very different um, uh, readings for the beef emission, for example, or pork, or, or whatever other like uh, pollution from, uh, from the agrochemicals. Because wha what he does is that uh, he's really pushing for the biodiversity, for the feed uh, for his cattle. Uh, he's not feeding grain for the cattle, which is mostly being done. Grain is not good for cattle. They get sick, and uh, then they need antibiotics. So uh, her ca uh, his cattle is uh, only fed uh, on uh, uh, grass, uh, and there's a huge biodiversity on uh, his lands. Uh, the cattle is moving constantly, sometimes even twice a day they change this uh, herding field. So that means uh, the uh, cross there is not going to get uh, like totally strand and, and uh, uh, destroyed, but uh, it will re remain quite healthy. And <coughs> then after the cattle has moved, three days later, his chicken will come in because uh, the flies have their larva ready in the shit, in, in, in the cow, cow dung. Yeah? So the chicken will eat this. That's the perfect protein for them. And then so the circle goes. He doesn't use any uh, mineral fertilizers, no agrochemicals. So if you would try to measure the emissions and the impact of this meat production, then definitely is very different to the industrial meat production that we have nowadays. So uh, definitely these sustainable ways of farming and agriculture are uh, a strong thing in, in the toolbox uh, towards the sustainable food system. Uh, anyone from the panel concluding here within five minutes? I just wanted to add that there is like project is amazing raising that also kind of of course uh, uh, values the role that the animals are playing in the ecosystem of uh, meadows etc etc but that was not what I wanted <laughs> to conclude with. Uh, I think that um, uh, this um, new business models, the same as uh, novel foods, uh, it's very tough to, to start developing because we are not uh, developing these things in a neutral context. I mean, it's always also uh, lobbies from different groups that want to keep the status quo. Um, but as we agree, the status quo is broken. And we really have to think and agree as a society that we want to move forward. And to move forward, we need exactly to understand what is myth, what is stereotype, and what is some kind of uh, factual knowledge. And I think that's where we can start. Uh, yeah, that, that's things. very interesting. I mean, uh, Petri, for example, do you meet any resistance from the established uh, industry? Uh, not yet. Uh, I guess at the moment, uh, industry is actually interested in, in alternatives as well, when it's probably getting bigger than uh, I believe there will be. Uh, but I think it's uh, with 
like with every uh, other technology that, uh, well, technology changes our ethics. And uh, when we have developed products that uh, are nutritious to us, uh, which have a lower footprint, they are tasty actually, and much healthier for us, then I guess it's an easy uh, switch. But it probably uh, takes uh, a lifetime or more uh, to happen. But I believe that this will happen and then our ethics will change as well. And when we are looking back, then we think that uh, maybe it was actually weird that we were like barbecuing animals. Yeah, but I mean, uh, Madi still uh, uh, gave some uh, s s a survival case for cattle, at least uh, part, part of them, or, or in some conditions, as, as you just described, the, the regenerat regenerative uh, agricultural case for this. Uh, well, I would perhaps conclude that every transition takes time. And um, it's, it's a long way to come from one point to another. And perhaps also that, um, also the, the I of course, you can put a lot of emphasis uh, on personal choices, and that's right. And we, 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 cannot, we all matter, our choices matter. But uh, the surrounding socioeconomic system also matters. And uh, as long as the uh, prefabricated meatball or the Polish apple is cheaper than your novel food or, or the steak of the, of, the, of the cattle that you just described that have great living conditions, etc., and well feed. So uh, as long as, as uh, these new things or, or these uh, good things uh, are much more expensive, so there, there need to be the comparative prices have to change so that they would not be as expensive anymore, so meaning that the other, uh, the easier choices might be, uh, should be taxed heavier. And also that the low income uh, groups in the society have to be subsidized uh, to be able to cope with this uh, uh, food uh, prices, uh, raise of the uh, general uh, level of food price. Oh, I'm sorry. So yeah, that was it. Leslie, yep. yeah, I would conclude with one keyword diversification. So we need to diversify our foods. We need to diversify how we are producing the, the food. And, and I will also give another fact sheet. If you look at the major grains and, uh, I would say grains that, that we are consuming, it's rice, soy, wheat, and corn. But we have much more possibilities than these four, four grains. So diversification. We need to diversify our protein sources. We need to diversify our, our food sources, not only protein, but expanding yeah. it. <coughs> and then also diversify the way that we are producing the food. I'm referring to fermentation made production technologies. Thanks a lot. Uh, I think this diver diversification from uh, from farms to, to plates is, is really uh, important notion. And uh, let us then support uh, innovative uh, new food production methods uh, and more sustainable uh, uh, agribusiness models. Um, I thank you very much for being uh, a really exquisite audience of uh, being willing to change your own habits and uh, also engaging with us. Thank you Nordic Council of Ministers for putting this up and uh, see you next time. And the last note actually, I, I, I think I can extend this welcome to our, the garden party over there in the pink house. There might be some food even left. But no meat. I don't know. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you.